Hello and welcome to At The Yard. I am Jim Salisbury of NBC Sports Philadelphia, joined by my buddy Ricky Botalico, former Phillies all-star closer. And today we're like, uh, it's like the teacher has left the building and, and we get to <laughs> cut up with the, with the substitute, Corey Seidman, um, off doing big cheese things yeah, with, with the big cheeses. And uh, so we are left to carry the ball. You ready to hit the hole? I am. I'm ready to go. So it's uh, mid-January. Spring training is bearing down on us, but it's that time of year yeah. when um, the uh, Hall of Fame is in the headlines. It's an exciting time. And uh, yesterday uh, was the you know announcement of the results. Two new Hall of Famers, actually three, uh, Ted Simmons, which I, I think was a great move. I think he was very deserving. I remember watching him as a kid. I've gotten to know him over the years because he's a scout with uh, – he's bounced around. I think he's with Atlanta now, but just a – Tremendous, tremendous uh, ball player, uh, cerebral catcher with uh, a number of teams, the Brewers, the Cardinals, and a uh, great run producer. And uh, uh, he was like having a pitching coach uh, behind, uh, behind the dish. It's always nice. Of, uh, as, uh, former, as guys who pitched to him over the years have told me. So I'm really happy for Ted Simmons. Uh, happy for Derek Jeter. Obviously, he deserved it. And ha Larry Walker, a, you know, a, a great player in his own right, gets in. On, on his tenth and final year on on the um, on the writers' ballot, yeah. you faced him. I did. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was with the S, uh, the Expos mm -hmm. when I first came up, and then obviously saw him a lot with the Colorado Rockies. Strong hitter. I never really had that big of a problem with him. No, that's one. Yeah, what, what, I, how, I can't say you... that for all those Rockies, but he, he was um, he was one of those guys that I wasn't wasn't afraid. I, he played I. My pitches played into into him not hitting the How ball. How did you attack was. him? A lot of away stuff. Away. I used to try Soft to make. Soft away? Uh, I would go try to try to uh, fastballs with movement on the outside part of the plate and then move them off the plate. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he's one. <laughs> you're going to love this. He's one of the guys when I played for a different team other than the Phillies that the first time we would face him, the starting pitcher would hit him. Um, to let him know that we would come inside. I love that psychological and warfare. It, it was against Larry Walker. He was one of those guys that that let me let me put it this way. It was it was something that had to be done every time we faced him, and I never understood it. But I I get the outcome. I mean, he really against that team I was with. I got to hear more about this. Was this the um, sort of the brainchild of the manager, the pitching coach, or something? It was starting probably came a up mix with? of the manager and the pitching coach. And did you think it changed his mentality? He didn't dig in as yes, much. Yes, it definitely did. Wow. Yeah. That's old school, man. It was old school, and it was back in the day where where that kind of stuff happened. And and as for uh, him, great hitter, uh, hard nosed player, and then Derek Jeter. How, I mean, how uh, my my Larry. I just want to, my, oh, I, I just Larry Walker. I um, I always liked watching him play because he played with a lot of personality, and I liked that. He was always player. mad. Yeah, but he, mad. but he, but he also he exuded a love for the game, yeah. and, and, which you know, remember that he grabbed the popcorn from that kid in Dodger Stadium. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, he gave the ball away in Dodger Stadium. I guess that's helmet. what it was. And and the thing in the All Star game. And uh, I just I just remember when he went to Colorado and became lethal. Uh, he's a great player in Montreal, but in Colorado, the way a ball jumps there, I still can see him. So I remember sitting in the press box and seeing him hit this line drive. It felt like it was twenty feet off the ground, and it hit the back wall. Remember that back wall yeah. uh, beyond beyond the bullpen, beyond the bullpen, yeah. cinder block wall, and, and, and it ricocheted off that. And it was like it got out of the stadium in a half a second. And 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 you know something odd? You've been out there. I don't know if you've ever been in the bullpens out there, but the bullpens are deep. That field is huge. The bullpen. I've stood above like there, the bullpen. There's the, the wall. Concourse. Then there's two walkways. Yeah. Then there's two pitcher, pitchers' mound. Then then there's there's plants and trees, and then there's a wall. So I mean, it, it was a good hundred feet back. For, for, well, close to 100 feet back from the from the home run fence in right center field. I mean, that that's a bomb. Yeah, total bomb. And and you mentioned Jeter. You know, that was a no-brainer. Jeter w was going in the Hall of Fame, and I know he didn't go in unanimously. Big controversy, I guess, that he didn't get uh, – he didn't how appear, could he not? He didn't appear on one ballot. Yeah, I, I questioned how, how can he not vote for Derek Jeter. I mean, 14 All-Stars, five World Series rings, what, number, five Number six gloves, on the all-time list hitting? Number six uh, hits? Yeah, in hits, 3,460 hits or something who, like who, that. See, and, and in my opinion, I don't know how, how you'll feel about this, whoever did not vote for him should be taken off of the voting list. I don't think he can do that because, you know, every guy's ballot, he's the judge and jury of his own ballot. And, you know, you, you have that freedom to make 
make your own mind up. You can disagree with it, but why? Because I think you don't you don't like the Yankees, or you don't like the guy. I don't know what his criteria was. I mean, as a journalist, and you know, the voting body is made up of journalists. We strive for accountability, transparency. I think it would be you know nice to hear uh, what that person was thinking, but we may never hear what he was thinking because See, there is no. It's not required that somebody, you make somebody's make your, gonna find your, it. Your, your ballot. It's not required you make your ballot public. I mean, it's kind of uh, encouraged, but not required. But I just think I'd hate to see this dampen um, the fact that Derek Jeter got 99.7% of the vote, which is the highest ever for a position player. And he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, that's rare air in itself. Yes, there's this little subplot about not going in unanimously. But in the end, I don't think that matters. Uh, he's probably uh, going to bring that up in his speech. Eh? He doesn't care. I, I'll, I'll bet you. He I bet he doesn't it. even touch it. I mean, Babe Ruth and and, and actually, uh, uh, you know, DiMaggio, DiMaggio, yeah. and and Ken Griffey Jr. Those guys weren't weren't uh, unanimous, uh, but you know, they're they're all Hall of Famers, and 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 that's the important thing. And and um, you know, I was privileged early in my career to cover Derek Jeter when I worked in New York. Um, I was beat man for the Yankees at the New York Post, and that was Derek Jeter's yeah. rookie year in '96. And he was a different guy then. It was funny. He shows up at this, as this rookie, and they're going to give him this starting shortstop job, bat him up top near the uh, top of the lineup. And by the end of the season, they win the World Series. By the end of the season, at age 21 years old, he is the leader of that team. That's unreal. That, that season, guys that, are looking at him. That team was O'Neill, Girardi, Cohn, um, Bernie Williams. Uh, Wade Boggs was on that team. He picked up Charlie Hayes late. Uh, Tino Martinez. And, and the leader of that team at the end of the season, everybody would look to he took to over. Derek G. He took over and he, he handled it with such grace and maturity at that age. It was amazing. But that's the one thing that almost bothers me more that he didn't go in unanimously is because that being said, a guy who could step into a lineup like that, become a quote unquote captain right off the bat. That's special. It was. I mean, and it's the New York Yankees at the time. The New York Yankees were were, were the highlight, not the, just the at neon that time. lights. You know, that that's a guy that that stepped into the biggest, brightest lights and never looked back. I have. Uh, I want to tell you my favorite Derek Jeter story. So in '96, he's he's a young kid, uh, just to the major leagues, and he was different then. He wasn't Derek Jeter, the um, corporation. You know, right? Uh, he was a lot less guarded. Uh, in later years, he had to guard his privacy, and he became, um, you know, he kind of put up walls. I think you have to do that. You know, you live in, you lived in the public eye. Yeah. But um, in those, so I'm working on a uh, feature story on him, doing a little bit about his background, and he's talking about his dad. He's talking about his mom during this little interview we're doing in the clubhouse at Yankee Stadium, and I just said, you know, I'd like to talk to your dad. Do you have his phone number? And he gives me the dad's phone number. So I uh, call up his dad. And uh, have a nice conversation about what, you know, what it's like to watch your son live his dream, play for the Yankees and uh, what he was like as a kid growing up uh, playing ball. And then um, his dad hands uh, Charles, his dad's name, hands the phone to, to his Derek's mother. Uh -oh. And uh, she starts telling these great stories about Derek as a kid. And the best one she told was she said, you know, in our bedroom, we had a full length mirror. Uh, behind the door, and she said every night Derek would come in and imitate Dwight Gooden's pitching motion in the full-length really? mirror. And and as a kid, like a junior high, high school kid, he'd imitate Doc Gooden's pitching motion a as a kid. And she'd say, Derek, will you go to bed, please? Enough of that, right? And so so what happened that year in 1996? He played shortstop behind Doc Gooden for a no-hitter. So he went from imitating Doc Gooden's pitching motion in the mirror in his parents' bedroom to playing shortstop just in a few years behind Doc Gooden. See, so that, that to it me just is shows how, how these are actually real people with real dreams, and they once upon a time were all just kids with big dreams. You must have done that in the backyard. Oh, I did. I mean, I was obviously I was a Yankee fan when I was a little kid. And, and, I never it, knew that about you. Yeah, well, I grew up in Connecticut, so it was either the Red Sox or the Yankees. I mean, to be honest with you, and wasn't a big Boston fan <laughs> for any of their sports, actually, so... Um, yeah, so I was a, I was a Yankee fan and I mean, but I was more of a love of the game fan. Me too. I really did. Yeah. And it was funny because I was a catcher. I obviously loved Thurman Munson. and that was my, my number one guy. But number two was Jim Sunberg. I remember Jim from the a Texas lot of, Rangers. Yeah. A lot of people kind of big gold glove guy, mm -hmm. always getting glow, gold gloves, had a cannon for an arm, good footwork. You always get released the ball. Well, it, it's just something that when you're a little kid, you, you kind of grasp. 
onto something, and mine was catching at the time. I love that you said that you were a f- like a love of the game fan. I, I used to. You know what the greatest thing in the world to me was waking up on a Saturday morning and knowing that this week in baseball was no. Oh, wait, wait, wait! Show. Time out. Knowing that in this six, in this order, the baseball bunch was coming on in uh, this week in baseball, and then the game of the week all lined up too. perfectly. I loved. Uh, this week in baseball, we used to play in the backyard, and we we you know that song. Da, 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 yeah. da, we'd we'd uh, try to do that song, and um, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. I but I was the same type of fan, like love of the game fan. I used to love the game of the week too because I grew up in New England, like you, and I, I watched a lot of Red Sox. Right. I was a Red Sox fan. That uh, was that was what we watched. But I skipped I school loved for the it. seventy the Bucky Dent home run. Oh, I skipped school to watch. I it. remember where I was in seventy eight. I was playing a middle school soccer game, and my mother was on the sidelines with a radio, a transistor a radio. Radio. They should have canceled that game. <laughs> and she's giving me updates, and Bucky bleeping Dent hits that home run. But oh, yeah. being a fan of the game, I loved it when because I, I grew up in near the American League. And in those days, media just wasn't what it was. We didn't have the saturation of nonstop sports. And I used to love watching the National League play. Um, I loved Davey Lopes. He was my favorite, uh, you know, non-Red Sox player. And I used to love to watch. The, I love to see the Dodgers uniforms with that red numeral. I love the Phillies light blue uniforms. Uh, I love to see AstroTurf like in those days because you never saw it much yeah, in the American it was League. Different, wasn't it? And it was really, really cool. But we're kind of getting off on a tangent here. It doesn't matter. Okay, we can do that. You well, think- it doesn't matter because it, th- that's what baseball is all about. Baseball is about. I mean, you think about Derek Jeter and where he went from. He's he was living a dream. Although he turned into a different type of player. Yeah, he, he was uh, one of the best of all time. And yeah, he it was. was. A, it was a, a privilege to watch him play, and um, he's, he's where he belongs. He's, he's in Cooperstown. And, and there's another guy who um, we both know very well who made a very good showing on this ballot. Actually, two of them. Scott Rowland made a good showing. Nice jump into, into the, I yeah. think, 35%. He's, what, three years on the ballot. I think Scott Rowland... Uh, lines up pretty favorably over his next six or seven years to, to give it a good run. But Kurt Schilling is down to two years remaining on the writer's ballot. And he made his strongest showing yet at 70 percent. And uh, things, I, I think, uh, things I think are lining up very positively for Kurt Schilling over oh, his next couple of years. through the roof. He loves this stuff. Come on. Hall, but, of, Hall of Famer? Yeah. I think. I mean, you take a good look at his postseason numbers. I think he was, what, 21 and 8? Is that pretty close I, I know he was like five and zero oh in elimination games so i've always said if i had to win one game he'd be the guy i'd want on the in mound and two, the numbers back it up in a 2-2 era yeah i mean just just amazing in in big games he, he could find that motivation and um he's just this adrenaline junkie loved big games and Bumped i his chest man yeah. when, when that guy but he when backed you, it up when you gave him the ball I, I, and i'm gonna tell you something we i was on a couple weak teams with him uh, in Philadelphia at times. And, I covered those teams. But you know what? I always remember, hey, every fifth day, I'm there's a pretty good chance I'm getting a save here or or I'm taking a rest. I used to call it, you know, Schilling would pitch would be pitching. I used to call it the weekly win. I used to <laughs> – uh, best games ever were Schilling against Maddox. That game was over an hour and 28 minutes, and we were out the door. I remember 1997. It was a dreadful Phillies team. Labor Day, searing hot Labor Day at Veterans Stadium. Phillies playing the Yankees. Uh, who had been the world Didn't champion. Didn't sweep them at that point? I, I don't remember, but the Phillies are playing the Yankees the year after, Jeter's second year, the year after the Yankees win the World Series. The Phillies are a dreadful team. It's Labor Day. It's really hot. Schilling is pitching for a bad Phillies team, and uh, that was his personal World Series. And he goes out there and strikes out 16. Yeah. And, um, you know, O'Neal, uh, talking to O'Neal after that game about how dominant Schilling was, little things like that. Where, where he he found motivation in that stuff. I mean, he had what he how many three he had back to back three hundred three hundred yeah. strikeout seasons. Do you remember that year he, he finished uh, in the in the hurricane in Miami with oh. with uh, the three hundred strikeouts with the welts on his body from the uh, from the paintball, the paintball game? game? Yeah, he did. You guys were nuts. We were out of control. That was an out of control weekend. Yeah, Kurt Kurt finished up strong. The one thing about Schilling that I found amazing because obviously you're on the same team as him. I'm watching what he's doing and every game. If you notice the first one through nine hitters, what, what stood out to you? Can you figure out what, where I'm going here? He did not 
go with anything but a fastball. fastball. Established his fastball away. Yeah. That's why he gave up a lot of foul balls. And, and the veteran stadium press box was a dangerous place when he was pitching oh, yeah. for right-handed hitters because he, they'd peel off these foul balls. That's why he ran a lot of high pitch counts. And I think the addition of the splitter later in his career really, really helped him manage his pitch count because he, now he had this, this unbelievable put-away split, pitch. That split right? was nasty. It, it was odd. The, the one thing that was amazing to me is he had the same type of surgery I had with the labrum, mm -hmm. and he came back strong. Being a starting pitcher, I think, helps that because you get rest in between. But, I mean, this is a guy that went through some injuries. Uh, he went through his ups and downs. Let's face it, early on in his career, he almost didn't come back to the big leagues. He had, a like, a really uh, extensive surgical procedure on his shoulder, I remember, in, in the late 90s. Dr. Morgan, who did yeah. your surgery, did it. And it was called, like, he had laxity in his shoulder. and they, they Slap lesion. He, they shrunk his shoulder capsule That's with, not good. With, with heat. Yeah. And they don't, I don't even think they do it anymore. It's like a they call yeah, that they a thermal, doing, a they, thermal shrinkage when, or something. When, when I had my surgery, I asked the doctors not to do it, but in the I, I guess protocol, you had to do it. Right. And I, I really believe you lose your range of motion because let's face it, we all have loose loose shoulders as pitchers because that's where we get our range of motion from. And when when they tightened it up. It was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me. Really? Well, I guess it worked for him because yeah, he went on to have a, a marvelous career. And I think, as we said, we both believe he belongs in the Hall of Fame. And, and I think he's going to he's going to reach that, um, you know, that gilded status in the next next year or two. Well, Jimmy, guess what? What? Team Toyota is kicking off a new season with safety, savings and service. Visiting a, visit us at TeamToyota.net to be part of the team and stay on the road to victory. All right, Jimmy, now we can move on. Speaking of teams, the Braves, the Atlanta Braves, um, they, they've had a nice offseason. One of the Phillies' main competitors. Um, you know, they added Marcelo Zuna on a one-year contract. Love one-year contracts. Uh, you know, Didi Gregorius comes to the Phillies on a one-year contract. I think guys play with so much motivation yeah. to get back out there, and I think it's a real win situation for the team. But anyway... Uh, the uh, Braves, uh, division champs, they lose um, Josh Donaldson, but they do a pretty good job replacing that power in their lineup yesterday by signing uh, Marcelo Ozuna, Ozuna one year, $18 million. Last four years, 23, 37, 23, and 29 home runs for Marcelo Ozuna. Your take on that signing and the Braves offseason. I, I think it's a great signing for the Braves, and it's a scary signing for the Phillies. They, this is... Uh, how, how do I put this this off season? The Phillies have made a couple of moves to make minor improvements, I guess. Would you call it that? Maybe maybe a little bit better than minor. I think they both could be uh, significant improvements. Right. Uh, but they haven't improved a lot of uh, Let, all just, their holes. They let, haven't addressed all their holes. Let's just go with there's still question marks with the, with the Phillies. No uh, question. They still honestly look like a fourth-place team on paper. Yeah, and, and that, that's what scares me a little bit because I'm starting to have flashbacks. Okay, uh, I I was in the NL East for what eight years out of out of my career, and every year we were caught looking at, at the rear end of the Braves, and be, and that was because they built a team and they built a dynasty. So that team knows how to build their teams. They know what direction to go in. It seems like every time they're going to be in a bad situation, they make one move to make them better. And and right now. I mean, you look at that that team right now, they're starting to look like a powerhouse, and that scares me for the Phillies. Yeah, they're loaded with impact, young impact players who are getting better, and their farm system is very strong. They with have, a nice seasoning of veterans. Yeah, oh, and, f you know, Freddie Freeman is a, just an absolute uh, beast and a, and a class player. I mean, he's, he kind of runs that clubhouse. Veteran, uh, he's got, you know, many good years left. Uh, they're definitely a good team that is even – getting better, a legitimate World Series contender right in your own division. And then you have the World Series champs right in your own division in, in the Washington Nationals. And I thought it was really important for the Nationals. You know, their calling card has been their starting pitching. I know, right. they, I know they have great young talent in other spots. They lost Rendon, but they were able to maintain and keep Strasburg, keep their starting pitching intact. And, Which is um, going to keep them in the game regardless. And they have an amazing general manager, in my opinion, who never stops tweaking and, and – and grinding and adding and, and making that bullpen work and every year after year he makes really sound bullpen additions and so uh, you know the, and the Mets still have a lot of firepower in their starting rotation. Mets have some issues though. You're going right now without a manager. You have two weeks of spring training. That 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 to me is a big issue. It it sure is. They need to come up with a leader. Somebody can come up come up there and um, 
you know, stabilize things. I'm fascinated to see what they have. Man, what they it, do. It, it, to me, Terry Collins as a stabilizer for one year uh, would make a did lot. Did they hire make, him as a bench coach? Would make a lot of sense. Well, he's still in the organization. He had managed in the past. Uh, I think he – and he's reached, I think, this stage in his career. He was. The, did you play for him? No, not no. Terry. He was kind of this young, fiery guy, uh, you know, when he was in his 40s yeah. and 50s. But he's, he's, he's older now, and he's reached that – uh, revered status where you know he's almost like a, uh, a favorite uncle, and I think I think for one year he 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 would draw some respect in that clubhouse, and he might be a, a good guy to kind of settle things down and get, and galvanize things. But you know them, the Astros and the Red Sox need to make a move on a manager here uh, pretty quick, especially you know I think the Astros were still World Series contenders. They need somebody to kind of come in and 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 calm that you know awful situation down ditto for the Mets so I think have a chance the Red Sox still have very good personnel but obviously they're retrenching a little bit financially so we'll see what happens there's a there man I, I you know you go back to losing a manager with two weeks I mean there, that's a lot of regrouping you have to do very quickly and I, I don't envy the Mets Astros or Red Sox at this point look at looking for managers and looking to get things going in the right direction it's just not that simple um, but but when when you look at the NL East right now uh, I, I take I, – I mean, you, you still take the Marlins out of the equation. But the Phillies are are not looking like world beaters right now. I think offensively, I think they're going to be fine. Yeah, I like their lineup too. They could score runs. They they have some guys that are that are interchangeable. I like the, the addition with Girardi in there. I, I, he understands the game. He understands the analytics. He's going to be able to go 50-50 with this and, and really be a, a, a strong manager for the Phillies. So they made some strides. But the four and five position in the starting rotation, what's your take? Well, I've said this many times. I think this team's success is going to be determined by how much of a drop-off there is after Wheeler and Nola in the rotation and what they get from the bullpen. And I will say this. They need Nola and Wheeler to both be better than they were last year. But the drop-off after those two guys and the bullpen. So basically pitching, is, as we all know, is so important. But it's going to determine where this team goes. And they're rolling the dice on the same cast of characters in the bullpen that they had last year, rolling the dice on them getting better, rolling the dice on them coming back healthy. And there's a big risk out there. Uh, I like their lineup, but, you know, you know, it's hard to outrun uh, and play ahead of a, of a poor bullpen. They need a lot of good things yeah. to happen in that bullpen. Um, that we don't know if can happen. They need Saranti to come back healthy and effective. If that happens, um, that to me is akin to a pickup because he really got nothing out of him last year. You know what? That, that's the one thing that has bothered me. The Phillies really didn't touch their their bullpen. You bring in a Drew Storen, all right, you bring in a Norris, okay. Those that, are tryouts. Right, that does nothing for me. It, it, it doesn't really quench my thirst at all. My biggest issue is the injuries that you had last year, the Adam Morgans, the Sir Anthony Dominguez. We don't hear anything. All season about Sir Anthony Dominguez. Why do you think that was? Well, he he's actually there's actually he had a quote unquote strain. Oh, he had uh, no no no. But that's what they that that's what was reported at first. A a well, they elbow were, strain. They were pretty open with that because um, you know they he had and they were going to be cautious. He had a strain of his UCL, the right. ulna collateral right. ligament in his elbow. That's the big one. That's the Tommy John and that one. That was in he, May in. Uh, he actually walked off the field in uh, San Diego around June 2nd, I want to say. Right. So, you know, they were very open that, you know, Kapler said he's got ligament damage, which to me, you very seldom hear a manager say that the day after. Then they said, yes, it's, it's the UCL, it's the Tommy John ligament. The general manager comes out 10 days later and said that Tommy John surgery is a possibility. Everybody very open on, on the, on the uh, severity of this and the, and, the, uh, and the dire, you know, consequences that could go with it you have seldom hear people talking about the possibility of surgery until the guy actually has surgery right. well he sees dr andrews not once but twice and they say you know they put the brakes on the surgery the experts say you don't need the surgery you need rest and rehab he has done that he has gone through his rest and rehab period he is up and throwing he is I heard apparently he, he is feeling good um brian price the new pitching coach spoke about this the other day Quote, he was, uh, Sir Anthony's chomping at the bit to get going, and their big challenge right now is holding him back. Is holding him back because, I mean, obviously we've got, what, over two months to opening day. You don't need to turn him loose yet. 
Uh, but, you know, all eyes are going to be on Sir Anthony in spring training. I think they'll go easy with him a little him bit. And Adam Morgan, I think. Oh, no question. But they'll go easy with Sir Anthony and Morgan at the beginning. You don't need two months to ramp those guys up. And then around mid-March, I you kind of want to see them popping it and feeling good. Um, but what I, what I would do with both of them is pitch them their first three or four times in minor league games. I think that's probably something that it would just happen. makes sense Controlled to me. setting get them off the mound if the pitch count goes right. high but you need to see and good, i'm talking good, i'm good talking around the 10th guys. of march i'm not throwing these guys in games on yeah, february let 22nd. them bullpen let them build arm strength um because they're both very important but neither one you know especially sir anthony uh, you know though he's feeling good and though he's chomping at the bit he is to me not out of the woods until you see it in national he's, league he's uh, not out full of the... speed competition because it's such an uh, so it was such a the injury was in such a serious area. Right, but when there's damage there, the damage could come back. There's absolutely no doubt about it, unless you change your no whole doubt. your whole mechanics, which is not going to happen. It's like this unspoken fear um, that someday he's going to snaps. Gonna, it snaps. Right, someday yeah. he's going to need surgery, and um, uh, you just you, you know you hope he's uh, going to come back strong this year because they they really need a difference maker. In that bullpen, they're bringing a ton of guys to spring training with big arms and big strikeout totals. I did have a question guys that for you. I'm interested to watch. Go ahead. I did have a question for you because I really believe the Phillies are going into the spring training with the idea that okay, you're going to have Sir Anthony, you're going to you're going to have uh, Morgan. You need another setup guy, right? Either Vinny or, or Pavetta. What, what, I mean, that's my th my theory. I think they really want one of those guys to go out there and perform. No, I think they'd I think they'd love to see one of those guys because they both profile. With, Vinny could with, do it, no problem. They both have big arm and and strikeout stuff. Uh, whether or not they can throw enough strikes and handle the uh, temper temperament of uh, being a, being a reliever, and uh, they they and both guys really want to start. Right. Spoke to Velasquez the other day. He really wants to start, but I think both of them realize that they're in a competition uh. for the fifth spot. And somebody probably is going to end up in the bullpen. And, you know, I see, you know, both of those guys have a chance to be a difference maker down there. That's what this team needs. They need something unforeseen. They need a surprise to step up. They need Spencer Howard to come up and give them some good innings maybe midseason. But that's a whole what other. What if Spencer Howard goes down and dominates in spring training? Do you have that thought maybe that, hey, he, there's our fifth. Right I think there. it'll be something fun to write about, fun to talk about on, uh, on the air. But I think he starts in AAA. Because uh, he hasn't used that ball yet, and they also have to be very judicious with his innings this season. He's never pitched 100 innings as a professional, and they're going to have to ride that accelerator, back it off, accelerate, back it off, because they need to watch his innings uh, and his is essentially his season pitch count. Yep. Because, he, like I said, never pitched over 100, and you want if he's pitching good, you want some contribution in the major leagues, and uh, you want that contribution when when the games are big, but. Uh, if if they're watching his innings totals, uh, he he could run out at some point, and you might not even. Who knows if you're going to even have him in September? To me, that's a fascinating issue. Uh, if the team is good and he's dealing, how you deal uh, with with his innings total to protect him going forward? Because obviously he's a commodity that you need to protect. Once upon a time, the the Washington Nationals did it with Steven Strasburg. Oh, Steven Strasburg just helped them win a World Series. Uh, you have to be you have to watch those things, and he's a talent that. Uh, you must keep keep an eye on. So balancing his innings in, in 2020, uh, a big issue for the Phillies. I, I think my three things to watch, Reese Hoskins would be number one. Number two, obviously, would be the, the number four or five starter situation with Velasquez and Pavetta. And I, I guess number three has to be the bullpen. Going Agreed? into camp. Yeah, going into camp. I, I agree with you. I, Maybe I would, next week we talk about and that. And I would add briefly um, – JT Realmuto's contract, contract extension because yeah. if I'm JT Realmuto, I I'm a catcher. I'm 29 years old. I know my team wants to spend a lot of money. I'd like to have that thing wrapped now. up by opening day now. for the uh, security of it all. Now I agree. But uh, hey, it's been fun. We filled in for Corey Seidman. Hope we did a good job. He's up there. Uh, he's doing schmoozing, schmoozing with the big cheeses, and uh, you know we we kind of uh, took over the classroom today, and we appreciate you listening. To At The Yard, for Ricky Batalico, I'm Jim Salisbury. Catch you next time. Thank you.